Thank you, Jody. All right, good morning. It's good to see you here. Nora, I appreciate that, as all of us. This rowdy crowd this morning, isn't it? Clapping and yelling encore. It's a good, it's a good time, good music. Uh, appreciate it. It is a good special time of the year. I was reading the other day, actually, where July 3rd, 1826, Thomas Jefferson was laying on his deathbed. They expected him to die on July the 3rd, but he kept asking his doctor, what time is it? What time is it? And he lingered and lingered and lingered until midnight came. And they said, it's July 4th, sir. And he says, good. He lingered until noon and he died on July 4th, 50 years to the day that he wrote the Declaration of Independence. July 4th, 1776, he died July 4th, 1826. That's a powerful story in our history. That's interesting. But it's a perfect time, perfect weekend in the... John Adams died the same day, and Dave, you're good. You're right on it, absolutely. Uh, John Adams was, he died a little bit after Jefferson did, and John Adams' last words were, at least Jefferson, Jefferson lives, not knowing that he had died a few hours earlier. Anyway, uh, where am I? I'm in church. I'm not in history class. So let's get, to, let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the real stuff, the stuff that means something and lasts in our lives. One of um, talk today about here again as the as the church has grown um, you know we we've we've seen how the holy spirit has poured out upon the people upon the, upon the church the early church and how important this holy spirit outpouring was for its uh, for its beginnings and we saw one week how it just a population of the church exploded how people were pouring in uh, because they were seeing signs and wonders, and they were hearing the gospel preached with signs and wonders, and they were wanting to become believers. Um, last week, Bobby was telling us that, you know, as, as Satan so often does, he tries to break up what that is good, and, and he uh, tried to destroy the church from within by bringing deception on people that were in the church, uh, hiding things and being deceptive to try to bring down the church. Well, today, we're going to talk about a powerful young man, a man that we don't know a whole lot about, a man called Stephen, and of course how Satan uh, even got involved with that and um, um, tried to dis uh, divide the church through divisions inside of it. So we'll talk about that today. But we want to go to the Lord in prayer, asking him for his blessings and giving him thanks and asking him for uh, his power to, to show upon all of your requests. Um, I know we still have several a uh, very powerful request of prayer, people who are in desperate need of a touch of God, um, uh, people that are um, um, waking up this morning in, in need of a, of a touch. If God doesn't touch, then no one will touch, and we just um, yearn for that, and we continue to hold them up in prayer. I know that Leslie and Sandy are, are in need, and um, several others. Do you have any requests yourself that you'd like to bring out? Nora. Sally and Diane, absolutely. Any others? Nellie. Okay, Nellie. Remember Nellie this morning, absolutely. Miss Betty. Tommy, okay. Yes, for the slate. Remember Rachel. Hmm. Absolutely. Remember Rachel this morning. Any others? Tanya. Yes. Let's take these to the Lord in prayer with all seriousness of heart. This is a very powerful time for us as a church to join our voices in prayer as a congregation. We don't want to, we don't want to overlook anyone, but we want to enjoy. All, we want to bring them all together under the guise of the Holy Spirit and ask for His 
power to be bestowed. So join me in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, sure in thanksgiving of all the good things that you've done for us, Lord. Certainly to give you thanks for it, Lord, for a church that we can come to on this wonderful, beautiful day, Lord, that you, we can celebrate and we can worship and we can enjoy your presence. But God, at this solemn moment, Lord, we want to join our voices together on behalf of brothers and sisters that we love, that we know, that we know in fact are in need of a touch from your hand, a healing touch upon their bodies, miraculous movement, Lord, miraculous healing power, Lord, to be bestowed upon their bodies, Lord, at this time, this day, this morning. Father, we know that the situations, no situation is too great for you, Lord, and no time is too short for you to move in a mighty way to bring that healing. The healing's already been provided for. Jesus has provided the healing, Lord. We are to believe. We are to ask and to believe and to have faith that you are a God who wants to heal and has a desire to heal and has already provided it. We claim that healing this morning, Lord, upon all those who have been requested this morning for what they're going through now, for what they're anticipating going through, no matter what is happening in their lives. Lord, none of it has taken you by surprise, and we ask for your healing to uh, uh, healing touch to flow into their bodies at this moment, Lord, that they may know at this moment that they are being touched by your mighty hand. I pray for this day, for the lesson, for the worship service, Lord, may this be a day that we enjoy you and that you enjoy the praises of your people, that we can uh, combine our efforts this morning, Lord, just to draw closer to you in our, what we learn and what we hear and what we see. We ask these things in Jesus' name. We give you thanks and praise for being who you are and for always being there for us. Amen. Increasing ministry and Stephen's martyrdom. Um, obviously, most of us have, that have read the, the book of Acts, we know about Stephen. It's a, it's a great story. It's certainly one that we can never uh, get enough of when we read it. It's a powerful story of a young man that we don't know a whole lot about, but yet we know that he was a powerful person used by God in a meaningful way. And we also know that, you know, by the title of the lesson that he's going to be the first martyr, the first one who actually dies in the early church for his faith. We would assume just by reading the book of Acts, the first part of Acts, we know that Peter and John have been whipped, you know, when they've been brought in front of the court and for preaching about Jesus and they've been beaten and let go and and we had just assumed that one of the 12 disciples who are now considered apostles will be the one to be martyred. These are the guys who have walked with Jesus. They've talked with Jesus. They, they have, uh, they, they have um, uh, spent all their days um, uh, preaching Jesus. They're the ones that everybody's got their eyes on. The, the, the religious leaders who don't want to hear about Jesus or got their eyes on these 12. You would assume that one of them would be the one to pay the price. Uh, but yet it's an obscure young man that no one really knew uh, at the time, or, or they knew him, but we, we certainly don't know much about his history, but he's going to be the one to be the first martyr in the New Testament for the new church. So we want to get to that today because it's a powerful example. We learn from him and his youth of how we are to stand for our faith uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts 6 is where they pick up the story about um, the early church and what type of persecution they were going through or what was, what was Satan up to in this early church. Uh, we just came out of Ananias and Sapphira knowing what was happening for uh, in, in involving a few people inside the church. But now as you have a congregation, Satan is going to get involved to where he's going to try to divide the congregation. He's always been uh, an evil one that tries to divide and conquer. If he can cre create divisions in the church, then he can destroy that church if the church allows these divisions to fester and to grow and separate people and the love that we're supposed to have for one another. Well, this seems to be a simple problem uh, back in the early church, but it could have grown into a bigger one. So let's get involved with, let's get into the, to the lesson. Chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, church is still growing, People are, are becoming disciples of the faith, and the 12 apostles are teaching and preaching, and multiple people are coming in. When they were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. The Grecians here are Greeks. These are still Jewish people. Uh, if you look in the commentaries, they call them Hellenistic Jews. 
These are people, when they say Grecians or Greek Jews or Hellenistic Jews, these are people who have come into Jerusalem from other parts of the world at that time. They were Jewish people that were dispersed when the, uh, uh, Israel was destroyed by Assyria and Judah was destroyed by Babylon and they were dispersed throughout the region. These are Jewish people who have made their way back to Jerusalem, but while they were gone, they learned the Greek culture they learned the Greek language. They spoke the Greek language as their first language. It was the language worldwide. It was the, what they call the language of commerce. So these Hellenistic Jews are a minority in the church, but they are there, and they're more uh, metropolitan. They are the ones who, uh, I guess, the, the, uh, the native Jews would look at them as a little worldly. They've been around, and they uh, have the customs of the Greeks, not the customs of our Hebrew uh, Judaism. Whereas the Hebrews are considered those who were still native to Jerusalem. They, are, they kept the orthodoxy of Judaism, all the traditions. They would be looked at as the, uh, I guess, the holier-than-thou traditionalists, those, you know, you've got to do it this way or you're not, uh, you're not favored. And so you've got the Hebrews that were there locally, and then you've got the Hellenistic Greece, Greek Jews uh, who, were, uh, who were from all over coming in with their Greek culture and customs and even their languages, and there's a division. Now, the key part of this is both of them are Christian. Both of them have accepted Christ as their Savior. They've heard the preached word. There's no doubt when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, there's no doubt that there were Hebrews there, and there were also Greek Jews in the audience that may have given their heart to the Lord and joined the church. But it, was, it seems to be that the Greek Jews are in the minority, and something's happening there because it says their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. Their widows were being neglected. Apparently, the early church um, continued the tradition of the Jews in their synagogues of looking after widows that were in the community. You have to rem remind yourself that back in those days, women were not able to own property. They were really not regarded as someone that could uh, have financing and, and property and money of their own. So if they didn't have children to take care of them or some other family member to take care of them, they were left destitute, widows were. They, they had no one to care for them. Uh, if, they, if, if they didn't have the church, they would be left to beg or to starve um, you know, or, or to whatever, do whatever means they could to earn any type of money for their daily uh, sustenance. But in the, in the case of the church, the synagogue, the Jews had a time because Moses had told them back in the Old Testament, you got to take care of the orders, orphans and the widows. And he had three different ways that they were supposed to do it through their tithing, through their plantings. They were supposed to leave some for the widows and all orphans. And and the synagogues have established this through the years. Well, the early church is going to do the same thing because they know that Jesus himself uh, realized that the widows were something that was uh, something that we had to take care of. So they had set up a rationing situation where if you were a widow and you didn't have children that would take care of you, the church itself, the early church, they gave you daily food and money if needed uh, to get through your day. And remember, um, from a couple of weeks ago, when they started the early church, everything was in common. They brought all of their goods. That's what you know, came up with Ananias and Sapphira's problem. Everybody was to bring in their goods, put it in together, and out of this pile that we were all bringing our monies together, we were going to supply the need of everyone. Anyone that had need was going to be supplied out of that, that common uh, balance. And so the, it, what's happening is, out of that common balance, the widows are being taken care of, but there seems to be a problem in that the Greek widows, the women that are of the Hellenistic Jews, are being uh, overlooked, ignored. So this is a problem because if you allow something like this to fester, you've got the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebrew Jews together, and if that is a true problem, you've got a divisive issue that could separate the church. And the apostles know this, Immediately, they realize that this is something that Satan is trying to use. It's a factual thing. There's nothing here that's a lie. It's okay for a fact to come up. Here is the fact of what's happening in our church. Let's bring it to the light, and let's do something about it. And that's what they're saying. This was a fact going on, not a lie. So the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason 
or it is not desirable, it's not practical, that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. It sounds like an arrogant statement, doesn't it? For apostles, the leaders, you know, when a, when a problem is brought to them and says we've got a problem, there's partiality going on, there's the, we're, the, the uh, Hellenistic wit widows are being ignored, something needs to be done, and, and it's overwhelming uh, the, the help that we have, and they say, well, it's not right for us to leave the Word of God to serve tables as if they were above such a job. It's not what they were saying at all. They were actually using the practical application, the serious application of what this meant. For us, the, the apostles, the church is growing, and they're growing because we're spreading the gospel. For us to take the time to do the daily ministrations of the, ration, the, the rationing and, and helping of the widows and the orphans would take us away from being able to preach the word, study the word, and, and, uh, and pray. As a matter of fact, well, I'll get to that in here, here in a second. I, I wanted to kind of hone in on this fact that when they said it's not practical or reasonable or right or desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables, we have to take advice to this because in every church setting throughout the millennium, um, this has become an issue where churches have to realize that their, that their leader, their pastor, can't do everything if he does do everything, it is taking him away from what the 12 apostles were saying is the real proper uh, reason for being there, and that's to study, to pray, and to, to, to stay with the word. You can get bogged down if you're a leader of a church in all the minutia of the, act, uh, of the daily grind of the church where it takes you and pulls you away from that. We as a church should make sure that when we read the story of Stephen, we say, aha, what can I do to help if we see this taking place? So what they were saying is basically nothing is as important as preaching the word. Nothing is as important to a church than the preached word of God. You know, if, even if in a church setting where you have, um, if you have people that'll come, I have, a, I have a friend, I was gonna tell this story, I have a friend who uh, certainly, uh, he, he was not raised in church, but he found Christ and enjoyed going to church, and he chose a church that was somewhat of a contemporary church, and he didn't like the singing. So he would go in, after the singing would, would, was over and the preached word was getting ready, he would walk into the church. He would tell me that I, I wait out in the, in the parking lot until the singing's over, then I go into the church to hear the preached word. And what struck my mind is when he said he walked in, as he would walk in, he would pass some walking out. They were there for the singing, not for the preached word. And, and the problem that obviously this lesson is saying is nothing supersedes or is as important as the preached word of God. Singing, as much as we love it, cannot take the place of the preached word. It cannot overrule the preached word. The preached word is the essential fact of why we're here, and it's the why we, we do everything in the church, is the preaching of the word is what wins souls. So what they are saying, obviously, is we can't do this. We need help because we know what is most important. So, wherefore, brethren, they're looking out at the disciples, Look ye out among you seven men of honest report. That's a good reputation there. Look at, find seven men in the congregation of honest report, a good reputation, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we, that's an important word there, whom we may appoint over this business. He's telling the disciples in the church, I want you to choose seven men. Why seven? We're not, we're, not, we're not told why seven. The commentaries tell us that, number one, it could be that the number seven is the sign of completeness. Uh, number two is most Jewish communities, they would have their own uh, council, somewhat what we have like city councils today. is usually made up of seven men. That could have been the same thing that they're doing here. We don't know why they chose seven, but choosing seven men of a good reputation full of the Holy Ghost, and it's interesting here, why does it take being filled with the Holy Ghost to do the daily ministration of doling out rations and helping the widows? Why in the world would it take that, you know, if you're someone who's got common sense or can have just got the time and the ability, you should be able to help, you know, with the widows here. But they were saying it's gotta be people full of the Holy Ghost. 
this was a ministry. Anything that is done in the name of the church for the people of the church is a ministry of the church, and you are to be full of the Holy Spirit, according to the 12 apostles. I remember a, a, a fella who owned a business, and he was over 70 men, employees. He was, you know, they did hundreds of thousands of dollars of business every year. He was the leader of that, but he couldn't be a leader on a committee in his local church because he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was frustrated by this, saying to himself, I own my own business. I am over many men and women. I know how to do this, and yet you're rejecting me because I have not received the baptism. I'm not full of the Holy Spirit. He forgot that the church is not necessarily run as a business at all times, but it is a ministry. And in ministry, we want this to be a spiritual experience and for you to have the fullness of the Spirit to be able to minister. The power of the Holy Ghost came upon those people in the upper room so that they would be endued with power for witnessing and for serving. That was the purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to be a servant. And that's what uh, these apostles are saying is needed, is I need seven servants. I don't need seven businessmen who know how to organize and do everything out. I mean, surely they would know how to operate the organization, but I need them full of the Holy Spirit because this is going to be more of a spiritual thing than anything else because you can imagine that when you're doling out the daily uh, rations and money and everything to these widows, these widows, widows are not going to be able to have a relationship necessarily with Peter and James and John and the other 12 apostles. They're not going to be able to go to them on a daily basis and say, I want, you to, I want to tell you something that happened to me yesterday. I need, I need a conversation with you. They can't go to these 12 apostles, but they can go to these seven men that are sitting there handing out the daily food and the rations and talking and ministering to the widows. It's more spiritual than anything. Spirituality is what was needed because these widows needed to be built up in the spirit and they needed to know that they could trust these men that were coming to them on a daily basis. They didn't need to talk to businessmen. They need to talk to Holy Spirit-filled men of God who had good reputations and were there to minister to their needs. The apostles knew that, and that's why they required these things. And wisdom being the practical abilities to, to handle this situation. So in verse 4, it's not in your lesson text, but it says, why do we do this? But we, the apostles, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministering of the word. That's their purpose. That's why they are not taking on this duty. We're going to spend our time in prayer and ministry, preaching the word of God. And that is the important part of why we're there. It's also, uh, it's very important to know, too, that even though the congregation was to, to select the seven men, the apostles were the ones to appoint them over this business. They had to receive approval from the apostles. So, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip. Philip's going to be called the evangelist later on. He's going to be another powerful man. Prochorus, and Nicotcanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Nicholas, obviously a Greek that was cho chosen to be converted to Judaism. All seven of these men have Greek names. Because of that, it is assumed that they were all Hellenistic Jews, including Stephen. Either he was a Hellenistic Jew or he came from, uh, you know, and here again, Hellenistic Jews means that they have accepted the Greek culture. They've been brought in from other areas and they've settled in Jerusalem. Stephen is one of them. So to fix the problem, the seven that they have chosen are Hellenistic Jews to take care of this situation. And it said, and the word, and the word of God increased... And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Now, this, is, this tells the tale of why what the apostles did was proper. Because now that they have time to pray, now that they have time to, to spread the gospel, here's the results. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. That's not something that we should ignore. You know, there, there may have been in Jerusalem, in the, around the temple, there may have been as many as uh, 10,000 priests 
that were doing the daily operations of the temple. They would do shift work and all of that. So out of all these thousands of priests that are, are basically doing their Judaistic obligation, they are, they are, some of them are even converting to Christianity. And that's no small thing to know that the preached word of God is reaching the hearts and minds of those who are more installed into the old system. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. This is what is separating Stephen from the others. Here again, we don't know much about Stephen's background. We just know that when the scriptures tell us that he was full of faith and power and did great wonders and miracles among the people. This is a, this is a young man that God has chosen to use mightily. He's not only a good servant who is going to take care of the daily ministrations with the widows of the church, but he is a great teacher and preacher, and with the preached word comes miracles from him. And this is obviously winning souls over. God is using this common person. Now, the key part of this for us to realize is that we expect the 12 apostles to do these signs and wonders. We expect the apostles to be great speakers and teachers and for people to be um, you know, convinced of the, of the whole, by the Holy Spirit through their teaching. But here it lets us know that even a regular layman, someone that we don't know much about, one of us, a commoner like us, could be used by Almighty God if you have a servant's heart full of the Holy Spirit, willing to be a servant of the Lord, you can be used as well. And he is using Stephen in his abilities to preach and teach to win souls, and he is supplying the miracles along with this. And, of course, when that happens, it catches the notice of not only the people who are thrilled to hear it, but it catches the notice of those who want to snuff it out. And the religious leaders of the day... They want to snuff this out. It's, it's already, it's not bad enough that they're, um, they've, they've got, this new church has got thousands of believers. We know of at least 5,000 believers here now. It's not, that's bad enough, but then you've got to add on to the fact that you're losing some of your priest to this movement, this Christian movement. But now you've got this powerful speaker going out, and he's winning people with miracles. And they've got to stop this guy. They've got to do something to stop this. So then there arose certain of the synagogue. These are the religious Jews. And here again, you're in Jerusalem, so there's, there's various synagogues around there, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with St Stephen. So this is not Peter, James, or John going into these synagogues disputing and arguing and, and debating, I should say, the scriptures with these scribes and Pharisees and these leaders of the synagogue. Synagogues were places where you could go in and actually debate the scriptures. Stephen's going in there, and he is debating with these theologians of the day about the scriptures when it says these are... Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, these are also Hellenistic Jews that have come in from outside. The Libertines were coming from Rome. The Cyrenians and Ale was coming from northern Africa. Alexandrians were coming from Egypt. They considered themselves to be the most, the, the most intelligent coming from Alexandria. And then you've got some from Cilicia. Cilicia is where Paul's from. That's a part of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey today, Saul of Tarsus, Tarsus is in Cilicia. So this is people from his area that have come down to Jerusalem. They've formed their own synagogue. Paul may have attended this synagogue. He's down here in Jerusalem. He's being taught by Gamaliel, the leader, one of the leaders in the Sanhedrin courts, teaching Paul. He may, or at the time his name is Saul, but he may be in Jerusalem. Well, we know he is, but he's here. And he may even be in attending this synagogue of the Cilicians because that's his home people. So anyway, Stephen's going in, and he's, he is debating the Scriptures, telling them how, showing them how that the Scriptures point to Jesus Christ as being the Messiah that they've all been looking for their whole lives. Their forefathers were looking for this Messiah. He's already come in the form of Jesus Christ. He's debating the Scriptures, and they cannot break him from, from this. Uh, they're, 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 there's no way that they can, well, it says in verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he 
spoke. They were unable to resist the wisdom of the Spirit. Now, he is using God's talent through the Holy Spirit that he's filled with to dispute and to, to, to talk and convince people in the synagogue about Jesus Christ, and he's winning souls, and he's causing frustration upon those who don't want him to win souls. So they're going to do something to, to this man called Stephen. Then they, the they there is going to be the, the leaders of these synagogues, the ones that are going to, put a, uh, going to try to put a stop to this, they suborned or they induced, secretly induced men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They came up with false accusations about this young man named Stephen. They wanted to bring something up there that, that would cause him to have to go in front of the Sanhedrin court. The Sanhedrin court, the most powerful court in Judaism, they didn't hear just any case. They didn't hear just every dispute that you had. If you, you know, if you were a property owner and you had a dispute with another property owner, you didn't go to the Sanhedrin court. Only certain cases reached the Sanhedrin, but they had the power to really do things against a situation to snuff it out. And what we're seeing here is that the lies that they are springing up about Stephen are the type of lies and accusations that would directly go to the Sanhedrin court because if you speak blasphemous words about God and Moses, who they revered himself, then you're going to be brought up for charges to Sanhedrin. It reminds us when Jesus was on the earth. I had marked this. There it is. He had said these words in the 26th chapter. And he's telling his disciples, Now the chief priest and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came. This is the same thing happened to Jesus right before he was crucified. False witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow, Jesus, talking about Jesus, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? Same thing is happening to Stephen that happened to Jesus. Same type of thing. we got to go in front of this court. The court's the one that can lay the punishment out. They did it to Jesus. Jesus told the disciples that they would do this. They'll bring you in front of their councils and all that. And Stephen, who is not an apostle, but he's being brought in front of the Sanhedrin court with, this, with the same type of false accusations. They're claiming that he is speaking about, um, I wrote down a few things. They're claiming that he is speaking that Jesus of Nazareth is greater than Moses. This was blasphemous. This Jesus of Nazareth being greater than Moses. Stephen tell him that Moses prophesied that he would come. This is the one that Moses told you to look for, this Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed that Jesus was God. This is blasphemous against God to claim any man was God, equal to God. And that's what Stephen's preaching. He is God. That's blasphemy against God, they're telling the Sanhedrin court. Uh, Stephen saying Jesus was greater than the temple and he even talked about uh, d destroying this temple, this body of his, and in three days he would raise up, making that to be his body would be raised up as the temple. Well, this is uh, blasphemous words against our holy place, our holy temple, talking about how you're going to destroy this and that Jesus was greater than the temple. It says that Jesus was greater than the law. He fulfilled the law. This blasphemous against the law of Moses, if you think Jesus fulfilled it. These are things that, these are the accusations that are bringing up, false witnesses bringing them up to the Sanhedrin court while Stephen is standing there. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, the Sanhedrin court, all of them looked steadfastly at him. They saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. It's interesting. I would have loved to have been there to see this interaction between Stephen as he's being accused, falsely accused of all of these things, him being in front of the Sanhedrin court, similar to the way Jesus was, and they're looking intently at him and his face is shining as of an angel. 
It reminds us, takes us back to Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, doesn't it, where he's got the tablets in his hand, and he comes down, and the people look, and that's the first thing they notice is his face shone from being in the presence of God. And here's Stephen being falsely accused, and you're on the court, and the people that are in the courtroom watching this are noticing that his whole face is shining. It's been the face of an angel. And so they ask him, basically, what are you going to say about these accusations? How are you going to defend yourself? I don't have time to read the entire seventh chapter, but the whole seventh chapter of Acts is Stephen giving an account, not only trying to defend, he's not trying to defend himself, he is giving an account. He is taking this opportunity in front of the most powerful court in the land to give them an, an, an answer to why Christianity is moving forward and is so powerful because the gospel of Jesus Christ was something that was prophesied from the early days all the way back to Abraham and all the way in. We have, we have met the time. This is the time that Jesus has come, and he starts telling them about Abraham, from Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, and Jacob had the 12 sons and how they would rebel and how they were put into um, um, Egypt, he brought up Joseph, how Joseph was a prototype of Jesus himself because he was rejected by his brothers, but he was a set and appointed a time to save his brothers and to save people from the famine, and how he was a prototype of Christ coming, and he, brought, he, he, he went through the whole history of, of Judaism, how God established them in the land of milk and honey, and how they rejected him, and how the, this people, these, these very leaders, religious leaders, killed all the prophets that God had sent to tell the people the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. Even telling him where he's going to be born. Look for it, look for it. And yet they reject him and they kill the prophets. And after he gets through this whole discussion about why that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he comes down to these striking words. After telling them about the whole history, he looks at these powerful men on the court and he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. Your forefathers killed the prophets who prophesied about the coming Messiah. He came during your time, and you killed him. You killed the very one that the prophet said was coming who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. You've been given the law and you're not even living by it and you're accusing me of breaking it, but you're not living by it yourself. You can hear them bullying. You can just see the Sanhedrin court bullying as they're sitting there. And it says that when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. We don't know exactly what that means. We don't know if that was some symbolic statement if, as they were holding their peace, grit, grit, uh, gritting their teeth in anger, or if there was some outburst manifestation of something that would show people that they're about to explode. We don't know. But Stephen, knowing that they're angry, knowing that they're about to just explode, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He is telling them what he is seeing, and because he is seeing this, they cannot take any more. He is, he is telling them not only did you kill Jesus, the son of God who was prophesied by the prophets that your forefathers killed, but I stand here in front of you today and I see him. The Holy Spirit is allowing me this vision. God knew what was about to happen to Stephen. God knew the punishment he was going to go through. Stephen may not have known it. He may have been a naive guy like me, just thinking, hey, I got my opportunity to, to speak my peace, and then they're going to let me go home. God knew what was about to happen to Stephen. So what does he do as he delivers this gospel, as he delivers the message that not only the Sanhedrin court would listen to or have to hear, but millions upon millions of people like you and me would be able to read in the scriptures of what he said, tying the Old Testament into the New Testament, the prophets into the, into the Messiah coming, linking everything together. This young man, this young layman, 
preaching better than anybody could have preached it to the Sanhedrin court and for all of us. He didn't know what was about to happen. God did, and he showed him a vision, gave Stephen a vision to give him the strength, the courage, and the faith to know that he is well done, well received. He sees this in the face of this crowd and, and says, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God and gives him that power and movement knowing that it was going to infuriate the Sanhedrin. And obviously it did because when they heard these things, they were cut. And in verse 58, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and crowd with, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. A powerful closing to this event. Not only does Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, led by the Holy Spirit, find it very important to tell us that at the feet of of a man named Saul was where those who were accusing Stephen of these false accusations, they laid their, their, their coats at his feet, letting us know that Saul was there, a young Saul. We don't know how old he was. It says he was a young man. Theologians believe that a young man could attribute anything from 20 years old to 45 years old. We don't know where Paul was. We don't know if he was sitting on the Sanhedrin court. We don't know if he was under the tutelage of Gamaliel at the time, if he was being educated by Gamaliel, who was at the head of one of the head leaders of the Sanhedrin court. We just know he was there. We feel that he was probably in the synagogues with, when it says the Cilicia church, uh, synagogue, when they were disputing with Stephen. No doubt Paul was there listening to this man and having his leaders dispute this man about the gospel of Christ but he's curious enough to be there. We don't know that he was actually a voting member to vote for the stoning of Stephen. We don't know if Paul was actually one. We don't believe that he was one that actually cast the stone because the stones were cast by those who had uh, given the false accusations. We don't know why Saul was there, but it's very important for us to know that he was there and he saw it. He heard everything. And it was a, it, we don't know at, at this point what that would have done to Paul's uh, psyche. We know from that point on he becomes driven to drive these Christians out, but he'll never forget what he saw or what he heard with Stephen. The beauty of Stephen, not only has God given him the ability through the, the, the vision that he gave him, but as he was being stoned, and I can't imagine dying through stoning. I, I just cannot imagine the, you know, the, the, the difficulty of dying through stoning. But the thing that we learn about Stephen is even to the point of death, the excruciating pain of stones being thrust at your head, at your body, his whole focus was not on the stones at all. It wasn't on what was killing him. His focus was on Christ the whole time all the way to the end. And being full of the Holy Spirit, even when the stones were hitting him in the head, taking his life from him, he has enough to say, Lord, Father, don't hold this against them. Similar, very similar to what Christ said on the cross. Don't hold this to their charge. Don't blame them. They don't know what they're doing while the rocks are hitting him in the head. I learned from this personally. I learned this, that, that when I see this, I learn to get my eyes off of what's killing me and keep my eyes on the Lord because my Savior is the one who's going to give me life even if what's killing me is getting bigger and bigger. It hurts worse. It's cutting deeper. My eyes have to stay focused on the one that will give me eternal life, and that's what Stephen is doing. He doesn't mention the rocks. He doesn't dodge the rocks. He takes it the whole time asking the Lord to receive his spirit and forgive those who are doing it. A powerful man that I wish we knew more about, this Stephen. But we should never take for granted what we learn through the scriptures of this powerful man and through what the Holy Spirit can do to a common individual. Sitting in a church, not knowing what to do with his time and his life, a need comes up, they choose him, he agrees to do it, and out of that, his whole life changes. He started his whole life serving widows. And out of that, we see what happened with Stephen's powerful ministry.
He accepted a job that most people would say, no, I want to be the speaker. I want to be the singer. I want to do this. He was willing to serve the widows, and look what God did with him. It's a good lesson. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead of you. We will get back into it next week as we continue to study the early church. See you then.
morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? I've been better, not been worse. But coming to church today made me a whole lot better. Amen. Being here with you today made me a whole lot better. Several prayer requests we want to make mention of as we start this morning, as we kindly call ourselves together, continue to pray for Leslie today and Shannon and that family, that God would touch them during this most difficult time. Brother Charles is here today. Wave at me, Charles, where people know who Charles is. Uh, Charles' wife, Sandra, just passed away last week. Her memorial service will be at 3 o'clock this coming Saturday here in the sanctuary. So uh, be in prayer for Charles and, and uh, that family there. This morning, Nora's asking prayer for Diane Oliver um, and her sister as well, Sally. Um, this is uh, Nora's niece as well as uh, Diane is in Concord in hospice. And also, I guess she is our the, the person today from the furthest away place. This is Loretta from South Africa. God bless you today for being with us today. Amen. Let me mention to you this evening, we're going to have a 4th of July time of fellowship this evening in the gymnasium. We're going to have finger foods if you bring them. We're going to have homemade ice cream if you bring it. And we're going to have store-bought ice cream if you stop by the store on your way to the church and get it. Tables will be set up in the gymnasium. We'll also be having finger foods and sandwiches and stuff like that. So we're just asking you to bring something uh, of some sort, um, even a vegetable tray or something that you can share, uh, be a part of that. And uh, that's at 6 o'clock. We'll just keep it at 6 o'clock, and that way we eliminate any confusion about the time. So that's this afternoon as well. I want you to stand with me. We're going to do something that uh, we don't normally do. Now, when I was growing up in the church, we done things a little bit different. Those of you that know now, we do a little bit things different from COVID, since COVID. So we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to bump elbows. When I got into church, there was a uniqueness about the fellowship of the saints. There was a uniqueness to that. It was the building block and the foundation of the church. So we're going to do what I done when I was cutting my teeth growing up. It meant so much to me. You may not shake hand to hand, hand to hand, but we're going to sing a song today. And we're going to bring back some memories today, but we're going to bump elbows. Did you get that little part in there, Kathy? So when we start, everybody join in, and we're going to take a time to fellowship one with another. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. Somebody like Dixie standing by herself. Walk around a little bit. You 
there and you're literally taking time to do this, if you bump elbows with somebody and you don't know their name, now is a perfect time to say, what is your name? I want to get to know you. Some of you don't like fellowship. You ain't moved an inch. One more time. Might as well get used to it. kindly get back towards your seat. I got a question for you. Did anybody, did anybody in the room learn somebody's name that they didn't know before? Anybody? Can I see your hand? Marty, who did you learn? Loretta. Well, we all knew Loretta was in here. God bless you. We all knew Loretta. Anybody else? You learned somebody's name. Uh, yeah, you, <laughs> Deborah. Who is it? Lee and Pam. Let's let Lee and Pam know they're welcome here today. Anybody else? You learned somebody's name? Loretta, you got a list of names, don't you? I guarantee it. Who is it? Jacobs. Okay, all right. Anyone else? You say, Roger, who did you learn? Loretta? Okay, I thought so. Anybody? Lori? Paul? Paul's over here. This is Paul. He's a little shy, but he'll get over it. Anybody else? You say, you're a nut, preacher. No, this is how you build fellowship. And if you don't know who Steve Jones is, that's Steve in the yellow shirt right there. Yeah, that's Steve. No, I'm just picking on Steve. He and I pick on each other all the time. See, the thing about it is we, we come to church, and I'm not trying to ask for your social security number or nothing like that, but, but we don't know who we're among. We're among faithful believers that, that are part of the greater fellowship, not only of the church of God, but the family of God. And I'm so glad of that today. Amen. Now, every bit of that was uh, unplanned and unscheduled, and I just felt like I needed to do it. So let's pray for these prayer requests today and ask God to touch so many needs and so many families that are in need today. And uh, we just want to see God show up in this service today. So, Father, we love you today, and we honor you, and we praise you, and we thank you. We thank you for the time together on this 4th of July weekend, Father. So glad to be a part of America, and so glad to be a part of what you're doing in our country. But our country, our country needs to turn around, Lord. Our country needs you so bad. We need revival in the land. Oh, God, how we need revival in the land today, Father. Lord, we need to see people saved and born again and washed in the blood of Jesus and our families, God, restored. And Father, today we pray for these prayer requests that came in. I pray, God, for you that you would touch Nora's family, Diane, this morning, and her, her sister Sally today. Father, I pray for Leslie and Shannon and the family, God, that stands in need of prayer. Father, continue to touch Charles during this most difficult time, Father. And all these needs around this room today, God, you know more than I do what needs to be said and what needs to be done. Father, I pray your blessings upon this congregation, upon what, what we are here to do this morning. I pray for the anointing upon every song and everything that's done today. May the Holy Spirit of God inhabit this room. May the Holy Spirit of God inhabit this place today. Father, we honor you and we praise you and we thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Now, let's have church together. Amen.
Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? going to practice on you this morning. So y'all, I'm sure you've heard this song. If you haven't, just listen to the words of it and worship with us. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Speak the holy name. 
Amen. Come on and put your hands together and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, thank God for victory today. Have you got victory this morning? Amen. Every stronghold will come down. If you have your Bible this morning, turn to Philippians chapter number 4, if you will. I want to start this message this morning probably in a most unusual way because it's not my typical way of sharing the things that I share uh, on a given Sunday morning or whenever I get up to preach. But I want to share some things with you that came across my heart and my mind this week. So good to have Miss Shana today and Cattison uh, with us today. And also praying for Myrtle, Blood, uh, Myrtle Bloodworth, but Myrtle Riding Hour as well today. She had surgery on her foot, and uh, we're praying for her as well this morning. Philippians chapter number 4, there is a phrase in this scripture that I wanted to talk about this morning, and it's found there in this collection of scriptures that Paul was writing again not taking the time to go through the whole history of Philippians, but Paul again was in a most vulnerable and an unusual place when he wrote this letter. He was in a jail cell. And he wrote this letter back to the church there at Philippi. And Paul again was writing this, this message to them 
to remind them of a mindset, to remind them of how they could change their thinking and it could change their life. Now, again, I'm going to get into some stuff. I'm going to talk about some stuff today. And um, hopefully by about 220, 225, we'll be where we need to be with this message today. And um, I wanted to just open up here in the scripture. Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for you, for, for my joy and my crown, so steadfast in the Lord, my dearly beloved, I beseech Herodias and Stachiki that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement, also with other, other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Again, Paul was writing to these individuals from where he was at. And he told them there in verse 21 that they all need to be collectively working together, all in one mind and one accord, working together. And then he tells us in verse number 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be overcome with anxiety. Don't, don't let the cares of life overtake you. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. That's where we're going for a little bit this morning. Because I believe when Paul wrote this, that he put a connection between the physical and the spiritual. And I'll get into that in just a few minutes. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren... What so things are true, what so things are honest, what so things are just, what so things are pure, what so things are lovely, what so ever thing are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, let's say this together, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Look at this next little word. Do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Stretch your hand this way and pray for me. Father, I cannot in any way do what I'm called upon to do without you. Father, I need you today. I need you to touch my mind and to touch me, Father. I pray, God, that you would help me to be found faithful as we endeavor to do what we're doing here today in this service. Lord, I pray, God, that you would take control of every thought and everything that I'm to do here today. Father, I pray your blessings upon this congregation. Help us, O oh God, to not only hear the word, for faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. But James said not to just be a hearer only, but a doer of God's Word. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would touch our minds. I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts today, that we would be able to see and to understand what's going on in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Again, an unusual opening for my typical Sunday morning. Why? Things come to me the way they do, I don't know, but they do. And once they do, I just have to act upon that and try to figure out those things. So one of those things hit me this week as I was thinking about this verse. How many of you know that you are body, soul, and spirit? What is going on in your physical body today 
has everything to do with your spiritual victory. We can see again how that Paul reiterated over and over and Paul used these words uh, talking about the mind. I was thinking about how that years ago there was a commercial on the television. Some of you may not remember this, but I do. There was a hot frying pan and that hot frying pan was over a stove eye and then they would break an egg into that hot frying pan and it would show that egg frying and then they would use the phrase below it and it was a, a, a commercial about a drug-free America. And it said that the mind is a horrible thing to waste. And so all of that collectively come into my heart this week and I began to think about something that is most unusual for me but maybe not for some of you that's in this room. So I thought, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the, a scientist, neither am I the son of a scientist. I don't know anything about anatomy of the body, very, very little. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and maybe you are, and you can help me when I preach this message, but better yet, you preach it when your turn is to preach, and you can preach it better than me. But I thought, what does, what does neuroscience have to talk about the mind? Now again, this is not a message in a, on the anatomy of the mind, but I begin to think about how that the mind works, and the mind is connected to everything that goes on in your body. Your body, your soul, and your spirit. So therefore, your mind is connected to everything else you do. So in reading this little article that I read, and I'm going to talk all the way through all of this, in, in this particular uh, article that I read, I, I thought to myself, how does neuroscience, if you will, the study of the brain, how does that connect to your life and my life as it pertains to negative thinking? Now, there's nobody in this room that would ever think negative. I know that. I realize that. Nobody in this room has ever been captivated by negative thinking. I'm glad we're not that way today here at Thomasville. But if by chance somebody hears me somewhere along the journey that somehow is captivated by negative thinking, this message is for you maybe. Maybe it'll help you. I don't know. But I begin to think about in our world today and in our society today how that we are living in an outbreak, if you will, of negative thinking. Can anybody besides myself agree to that? I do agree with that. Because we are so prone in our lives today to talk more about the negative things that we see more so than the positive things we see. If you're around anybody for any length of time, you know and I know, and I see this, I do it, and God help me today after I preach this message to myself to break that yoke of bondage that drives me into negative thinking because I do this and I'm confessing to you that I need to break this over my own life today. And again, when we think about this, first of all, I understand and we understand that we are made up of a physical body. We, we have a physical body. And as a physical person, everybody in this room, uh, we cannot neglect the physical person that we are. We look at this and we understand that God made every person in this room with feelings and emotion that He alone, one of those things that He made was simply the mind that we operate in. But again, we think about this. All of us in this room, I would assume, and it's dangerous to assume, but all of us could use a touch in our mind from time to time. Again, you and I, we ask ourselves this question. How do we react to negative thinking? Now, that's going to be the crux of the message because Paul said, think on these things. And then Paul was saying at the bottom of this, in, in verse number 9, and we look at that, he says, These things which you have learned, learned, and then he says, and received, and heard of, uh, and seen in me. What does he say? He says to do them. And the God of peace shall be with you. Now the reason I said that, the way I said that, is because most everybody in this room that I'm preaching to this morning, and, and with this morning, including myself, we know the Bible but do we do the Bible? Hello? Did my mic just go off? We know the Bible, 
We know what to do. We know the right things to do. But yet, oft times, we, we fall into this miserable trap of the enemy. All of us, sometimes, we, 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 according to this article, it said our brains are wired to focus on the negative. Oft times, hopes of prosperity come. And yet, the letdowns of life, setbacks that send us into some type of mode of thinking. And we think to ourselves, what in the world is going on with me? Here's the big one. I must be damaged goods. We think that way. Let me see what page two has to say here. And it says we can look at this uh, information today. Again, I'm just giving you information that, that this individual put out there. So his name is Nate Klepp, K-L-E-M-P. I don't want to do any plagiarism this morning. But it says here today that, that I know that when we think about neuroscience today, oft times uh, it is different than our normal way of thinking. Maybe there's something in our, our, our lives today that, that we can learn as we look at this today. Neuroscientists have created a name for this negative thinking that's in our brain, if you will. And again, when you think about it, it says that oft times the, it's, it's called negativity bias. Anybody ever suffer? Don't raise your hand. With negativity bias. In other words, this negativity bias, if you will, is where the brain automatically resorts uh, back to negativity of the brain. And the brain is in a habit of thinking in negative cycles, if you will. In modern times, however, this habit of, of negativity bias leaves us oftentimes reacting to a harsh email or a difficult conversation and it happened to me yesterday as if our life were in danger and, 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 and as this happens it activates a cascade if you will of stress hormones and leaves us uh, finally if you will uh, 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 leaves us fixable and uh, 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 I guess that's the word I uh, wrote down there. I can't even read my own writing. And it said, in other words, when we see this happen in our own lives, when these hormones come to, to, come to play, it, it, it leads us to feel like we are being potentially threatened. And in this, we, that is the natural working of the brain, if you will. So, and, and when that happens, this writer went on to say that we're unable to see the bigger picture. I'll give you an example. If God be for you, then who can be against you? You let something negative happen on your job. You let something terrible happen to me like sometimes it does. And all of a sudden, everything in your brain begins to flash and spark. And you no longer think about the positive. You automatically resort back to the negative And you automatically go back into that. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing today. Paul in these scriptures, and this is what's on my heart. That was a little bit of what he said. This is what's on my heart. Somehow, we got to look at the scripture. Okay? Somehow, we got to look at the scripture and see what the scripture says. And then not only hear the word, receive the word, but we've got to apply the word. You and I, us and we, maybe nobody in this room, but we are, we are in a, 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 a cycle, if you will. That's the only way I can explain it. In a cycle of life. And in, in, in this cycle of life, the way I look at this through my lens of, of preparing this message uh, is that you and I are much different thinkers than the way the world thinks because we have a body soul but we have a spirit now i'm going to say something here in just a minute if i can if i can find my place on it and this is this is what what needs to be said today we need to think about what we think about in other words we need to think about what we're thinking about and if what we're thinking about is what we need to think about now i know that's a play on words but we need to think about what we're thinking about. We need to think about it. And then the second part of that and is what we're thinking about. Is it really what we need to be thinking about? And the reason that I say that is because you can, you can really 
Check your own brain and really think to yourself, is my brain really lining up with what God says about me? Example, Sherry's favorite verse, Jeremiah 29, 11 there, and it says that God was speaking to Jeremiah and he told him, hey, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I know my plans that I have towards you. He says, if you think about this, thoughts of peace and not of evil. God is not a God that thinks of you of evil, but He said to give you an expected end. Paul said, if God be for me, then who or what can be against me? See, in our world today, we go through these negative cycles of our life, and we carry in our heart, we carry over our lives as Christians, uh, we carry this victim mentality. We, We see and we feel that we are the victims of society. We are the victimization of those near us and around us and we get into this slump but yet the Bible my friend is extremely clear in what we need to do so hit the pause button for a minute so this little article that I read it said there's three things you need to do when you find yourself going deeper into negative thinking first of all he said you need to stop now that's my word not his but I'm gonna put that in there because it's very important We need to just stop. We need to pause. We need a see law moment. We need to pause and think about it. By that, I simply mean this, that this this article said you need to notice. Notice what you're thinking about. Are my thoughts lined up with God's Word? And that is really... The thing that somebody else actually said is that we're not trying to teach you how to think more positive, even though we need to do that. We need to, as the people of God, we don't necessarily need to be taught how to live more positive, but we need to be taught how to live uh, in biblical thinking. We need to think like God thinks. There's a couple of scriptures that comes to my mind. First of all, let me go look and see where they're at. First of all, we see these about how the Bible is clear about this. First of all, we see this found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, if you're writing that down. And this is what he said. He said, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, if I was going to say that in today's lingo, if I was going to put that in the lingo of society today, I would say it like this. Hey, man, you need to get a grip. And don't tell me the church don't need to get a grip because the church needs to get a grip. If it wasn't for my lovely, beautiful, awesome 38-year wife right here, I'd be a whole lot worse than I am right now. She helps me to stay very, very balanced in my thinking. I help her stay very balanced in her thinking. We help each other. But yet in the same sense, if you are infiltrated with negativism every day, day in and day out, somewhere along the way, you've got to do what Peter said. He said, wherefore, gird up. What does it mean? It means to pull together. You know, you've studied this, you've heard this, you've heard me preach about it. If a runner was running in the Old Testament, New Testament, and they had the long flowing robes, if you will, they would have to reach down, get the robes, pull them up, pull them around, put on the girdle of truth, if you will. They'd have to pull up all that, that, that waste, if you will, and, and pull it together so that they could run. And in a lot of ways, that's the way we need to collect our thoughts. Our brains go wild today. Hello? Is it making sense yet? Our brains think all kinds of stuff. And in thinking all kinds of stuff, we, we think all kinds of negative things. We think of things that, 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 that the devil's trying to do to us. And we think of things that are totally contrary to the Bible. So this first thing we need to do, we need to notice. We need to notice what we're thinking about. Then he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Somebody said, my mind's just going wild. Well, stop it. Quit. Today. I, I've tried my best to get this message the way that God would have me to preach it today. Don't let your mind go wild. Your mind is a terrible thing to waste. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. means correct, serious thinking. But be, be correct in your thinking. Think about yourself and think about your life the way that God's Word thinks about you and says about you. Amen? 
He says that we're more than conquerors. He said that we're victorious through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer the victims, if you will, of Satan's affairs, if you will. But we're, we're children of the Most High God. Hello, somebody. We're children of God. We need to think about those things. We need to think properly and correctly. And let me say this. Let me just hit the pause button and say this. As a child of God, I'm no better than nobody else. I, I, am, not, I am not prideful. I'm not egotistical. I'm not, I'm not full of myself, if you will. The only thing I want to be full of is the Holy Ghost. And there's some things that you and I, as children of God, there's some things we cannot do and things we cannot participate in if we intend to keep the victory. The Bible says we've got to be separate from the world. We've got to come out from among the world and be separate, saith the Lord. That don't mean I'm any better than anybody else, but I have chosen a, be I have chosen a better life for myself. I, I have chosen a better life for myself. He says, be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you. He said, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The next verse that I thought about when I thought about the mind, to put on the armor of God and all that, we've talked about that a little later. But Ephesians, again, he says this in Ephesians 6, in verse number 14. And this is a whole group of scriptures there, but I only wanted to use this one. He says, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. Have your mind girded about with truth. Thy word is truth. Hey, look at the word of God. Think about the word of God. Let the word of God resonate in you. And only, only build your life upon the word of God. Don't build it on what this says or that says or anything else. Build it upon what God's word says. You can't build your life on what they say. You can't build your life on what them say. Hello? You've got to build your life a victory upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. So the first thing we think about when we think about this, this first thing was, well, you got to notice. Pay attention to it. Pay attention to your words. Pay attention to what you're saying over yourself. That is just weaponry for the enemy. That's just bait for the devil. And again, when I say that, it's not an egotistical thing. I'm not going to pick on somebody in this room. But you got, to, you got to think of yourself. And again, the Bible warns us for a man not to think more highly of himself. I understand that. We'll look at that a little bit later. But don't go around saying these words. Are you ready for this? Don't ever go around saying these words. I'm dumb. Don't ever go around saying I'm stupid. Don't ever go around saying I'll never amount to anything. Speak positive things over your life, over your future. Is this making any sense to anybody? You say, preacher, I'm not living in that realm yet, but you keep speaking that over your life. You keep living that over your life. You live every day, live every day how you want your life to be, and this is what I've said over my life for years, and eventually your life will become exactly what you want it to be. It may take time, I tell folks from time to time, I said, you just do the right thing and eventually it'll catch up with you. Just keep doing the right thing. Keep speaking the right thing. So we got to notice. We got to notice our lives, in our minds, in our hearts. Again, when we think about this, we think about pay attention to how you are thinking again. Notice those things that we think that are contrary to Christ and to Christianity. Romans, again, we know the Scripture very well. Romans chapter number 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, as Paul opens this up, and he says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He said that you present your bodies. Your bodies houses your mind. A living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable, unto God. Which is your reasonable service? In other words, it's not beyond your capability. God says it's the very simplest thing I, to present yourself to God. Verse number 2, we know the scripture very, very well. And he says, and be not conformed to this world. But he talks about to be transformed. Transformed. I like that word. By the renewing of your mind. 
I don't know if this is making sense to anybody in this room, but, but you and I know and we all know that if we're not very careful, our mind will just be uh, going in the same way of the things of the world and, and, and we'll be thinking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world, doing like the world. But my friend, you cannot do that and I cannot do that. So we have to notice, we have to think about what we're thinking about and ask ourselves, are we really thinking about what we need to be thinking about? I know that is a play on words and it, it's a twist on words, but we really do need to ask ourselves that. But he said to be renewed in the word. We look at this word renew. When you look at this word renew in the concept of, 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 of Jesus coming into our heart, Jesus coming into our life, Jesus making a brand new heart out of us. He said that this word renewing means renovation. And it talks about God needs to come and renovate our mind. Amen. We need to get rid of our stinking thinking. And oftentimes that happens when we get a check up from the neck up, if you will. we got to check ourselves. Again, let me say this. we got to think about what we're thinking about and ask ourselves, do I really need to be thinking what I'm thinking? And I'll get into that in a minute. But he said, the renewing of your mind, renovation. We need to let the Holy Ghost come by one more time in the church and renovate our mind. When you think about renovation, it, need, it, 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 it gives the understanding that a, a new tenant has moved in. And, and it, the, the, the mind has been renovated by the Holy Ghost, if you will. It talks about the renewing of the mind. It talks about the mind as being the, the organ within the capacity of man where his conscious life is. And it talks about where that it's the mental ability. And then he talks about to be transformed, transformation, denoting change of, of condition. Again, when we think about our spiritual victory too often, it is, it, it is not uh, defeated in our, in our minds necessarily as much as it's defeated in our hearts because uh, the Bible said out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, whatever's going on in your, in your heart will eventually trickle up to your mind and it'll work its way out your mouth. Come on, somebody. So not only do we need to notice our, our capacity, verse number three in this verse says, he says, for I say through the grace given unto me through every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to, uh, as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. But he teaches us in this that we're not supposed to be puffed up with pride and puffed up like we're all that in a bag of chips, if you will. But we're to keep a good, healthy balance in our lives. Hey, you're not the scum of the earth. You're not the trash of the earth, if you will. But the devil's going to make you feel that way. The devil's going to make you feel like a nobody in a somebody's world. I've been there. i felt that way before. There ain't no telling how many times, whether I speak it or whether I say it, that I've had to jerk my own self up by my own bootstraps, kick myself in the backside by my own foot and say, you get your act together, young man, and you get back on the straight and narrow. I've had to do that to myself many, many times in my life. Many times, over and over. Because I would have let my mind go in places that, that I, I should not let my mind go to. So that, that led me to the second thing that I learned this week. Is there's got to be a shift in how we think. We got to notice, we got to pay attention, we got to think about what we're thinking about to see if we really need to be thinking about what we're thinking about. And then there's got to be a shift. So there's got to be a change. So in this, we see in several scriptures that, that come to my mind is again, one writer said it like this we aren't turning ne negative thoughts into positive thoughts. Now watch this. It's very important. We are not turning negative thoughts into positive thoughts. That's good. When we do that, we abolish the negative. Is this making any sense? We're abolishing the negative in our life by turning negative thoughts into positive thoughts. But one writer put it like this. Said, but we are taking our negative thoughts and turning them into biblical thoughts. I about rejoiced on my couch when I read that. That we're taking our negative thoughts and turning it into biblical thoughts also, and to do so, we must use God's Word to do that. So there's got to be a shift. This shift 
happens when you look in Philippians chapter 2. It's right there in the Word of God in front of us. Philippians chapter number 2, several verses of Scripture found there again in verse number 8 is talking about Jesus and Jesus' crucifixion. But he says this in verse number 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus, again, thought like the Father. He thought like God. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read the rest of those verses of Scripture, but it's where Jesus, again, He thought it not robbery to be, uh, uh, He was in the form of God, but He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He humbled Himself even to the death of the cross. That's what it's talking about down through there. But Jesus was thinking in a way that He was surrendered to the total will of the Father. It's a shift. The Bible says you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Somebody's going to, somebody says, I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And you'll never get the victory of Jesus in your life when you do that. Second thing is this, and I love this when I've been here so many times, and these, this group of the scriptures that we've used, and we've used it many times, I want to use it again. So there's got to be a shift, and in this shift we see this in 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I hope you write this down. We start off in verse number 1. We're going down through several verses of Scripture. When you look at this, this again was what Paul was writing. He says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in the presence I am base among you, but being absent and bold with you. Paul again was writing unto them. Verse 2. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as I, as we walked according to the flesh. Now look, verse 3. Paul says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. Paul said, Even though I appear to be in the flesh, even though I seem to be bold towards you, it was not my flesh that was provoking me. It was not my flesh that was coming out towards you. I'm not walking in the flesh. He says, We don't war after the flesh. He says that in verse number three. But look at verse number four. Look at the shift. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. See, you and I, we cannot fight what we're fighting in this world with just our brain. Hello, somebody. We've got to have the enabling power of the Holy Spirit of God to be able to win the victory that's going on or the battle that's going on inside of the people of God from day to day given any any particular situation. And we see this in the scripture where Paul was saying, hey, I'm not battling in the flesh. So this takes that shift and it goes a little bit deeper. Even though we think about it in our mind, even though we sense it in our mind, even though we feel it in the mind, there's something much deeper going on. And that is spiritual warfare. It's the attack of the enemy upon our mind, upon our heart. And he said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Look at this, but they're mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. Every stronghold will come down, Hannah. Y'all sang it today. I was over there minding my own business, singing, uh, thinking to myself, sing it, sing it, sing it. Because you guys and I know and we know that, that the battlefield is in the mind today. You know that. I know people. I know people. That you look at them and they'll flip out. What are you looking at me for? You must be thinking something negative about me. You must be thinking something's wrong with my hair today or something. I ain't thinking nothing. Don't get mad at the preacher. I had a girl years ago. I'm sorry, years ago. I'm gentle. I ain't saying no names. I ain't saying no names. Cherry knows. But we, we were in a choir years ago at a church, years ago. And we were in choir practice. Naturally, the choir's going to be looking at the piano player. We got to hear. We got to know what's going on, you know. And she was playing, and all the choir was looking at her. She flipped out right there on the piano, started banging the keys. Bam, 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 bam. What are y'all looking at me for? It's like, hello. (laughs) We're trying to learn here, you know. I have to say this sometimes our mind is just, whoo. And I don't mean that ugly, it's just the way that it happens sometimes. That's what we call an out-of-control mind. And I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not one of them other people that's, that talk about you know, all that other stuff. I'm just telling you what I believe in my heart. God wants me to bring here today. There's got to be a shift in how we think. And there's there's got to be a, a positive to how we think. And just because somebody looks at you, don't you flip out on them. 
I got to tell you a funny story, Kylie, to break the seriousness of the moment. And I will say this name. She might even be watching me. She was our piano player in Monroe. She was not this other years ago. But I had just went to Monroe years ago, and my, my good friend, she's my Monroe, Monroe mama. She's been here before. Phoebe. <laughs> Phoebe was there, and, and uh, I, I was, I, I'm, I'm just this way. And, and y'all, if I'm talking to you, you forgive me uh, before you even say anything to me. If I'm talking to Sandra, and Sandra's talking to me, off times I'm looking over here, and I'm looking over here, because I, I got this nervous tick that somebody's going to walk up behind me and stab me in the back. Just kidding. Uh, but but I, I, I'm more aware of my environment around me. Even though I'm talking to you, I may not be looking at you, but I'm listening. So Phoebe said, hey, you look at me when I'm talking to you. I just went to Monroe. I hadn't been there long. She said, you look at me when I'm talking to you, and I'm going. I thought, well, Phoebe, I listen with my ears, not my eyes. I hear every word you're saying, and I repeated verbatim exactly what she said. She said, well, I guess you were listening, wasn't you? I listened to every word she was saying. But I'm just thinking to myself, you know, people are just funny. So don't flip out on nobody. So we need a shift in our thinking. We need to think like Jesus thinks. So we need to look at the Scripture again where it talks about this, and I'm almost done, believe it or not. It's not 2.20 yet. And it says here in the Word again, and he says, he says, pulling down every stronghold. In other words, when you think about this, the strongholds that embed themselves within our minds. Another funny story. Some of you know what a quote-unquote red bug is here in the Piedmont of the wonderful North Carolina. If you're in western North Carolina, you call them a chigger. Anybody know what a chigger is? I've got a spot right here from me and Brother Roger getting wood the other day. I got another one right up there that I'm, I'm doctoring right now. Chiggers. When you think about this stronghold and you think about what it's talking about, I studied this before. That's what a chigger will do. It'll get in and it'll bury itself in. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to irritate you. That's what a stronghold will do. It'll get into your mind, it'll get into your heart, and it'll bury itself in. And my friend, there's not but one way to, to kill a chigger. And that's a smother him out, and you know that. What you don't feed, what you don't feed mentally, psychologically, or emotionally, will hopefully and eventually smother itself out. Last page. Oh my goodness, there's three more pages. I am so sorry, but I'm going to try to hurry. So what was, the, what was one of the ways that we needed to overcome this? Negativism. Watch this. It's a good one. Really good. We think about it. It says today we live in a world or a culture of thanklessness. We live in a world of entitlement. But a long time ago we come to the understanding that nobody really owes you anything but to love you. So we've got to find ourselves, watch this, into a new life of gratitude. It's really, it's really, when I read this, it was really something that I, that I really enjoyed reading, but it, it talked about when we find gratitude in our lives, it opens up space for carving new, new neutral paths in our lives. When we just pause and start, when everything negative is coming in on us, we need to pause and think on gratitude. And when you think about gratitude, we need to focus our attention on gratitude. This writer actually wrote and it said, a few seconds of gratitude is the most effective way to shift your brain from complaining to gratitude, from complaining to to being a positive, a positive in your life, from shifting your brain from one. And he says, what do you need to think about? Think about some of these particular things. Think of something that you're grateful for right now. Anybody in the room thankful for anything? Think about your life. Think about your life today. Think about your health. It's like the man that was griping because he didn't have any shoes. And he complained and he griped and he complained about 
not having any shoes until he saw a man that didn't have any legs. Attitude. Attitude. Heard another story years ago. I'm sorry, I got to share. I'll try to hurry real fast. I heard a story years ago and it puts things in perspective. It was two men in a nursing home. One man was in the mirror, I mean, excuse me, in a window, and he was looking out the window. The other man was over here on this side. He couldn't see the window. He couldn't see out the window. And the one man that was near the window every day, he would say, oh, the beautiful butterflies. Oh, what a beautiful bird. Oh, what a beautiful blue sky. And one night that man got sick, and he was aspirating, and he was dying. And this man over here, rather than calling for help, he reluctantly let that man die so that his bed could be scooted over near the window so that he could see the beautiful butterflies and the beautiful blue clouds and the beautiful birds on the feeder. But when this man shifted over here after this man passed away, the man was let down very much because when he looked out the window, he didn't see nothing but the block of another building. This man's attitude that passed was on the positive things, the nice things. The things that he saw in his own heart, the things that he's seen in his own mind. And a lot of times you and I, if we're just fishing for the negative. The third thing, the final thing is simply this. You've got to allow your brain to be rewired. You've got to let your brain be rewired. And again, according to this neuroscientist, it only takes 30 seconds. 30 seconds seconds, 30 seconds for your brain to pause and for your brain to begin to find paths of positive over paths of negative. So the next time you begin to think a negative thought, do what 2 Corinthians said, bring in every thought into captivity. Don't let your mind go wild. Don't let your mind take you to a place that you know in your own heart that you don't want to go. Bring it into captivity. Again, he, he talks about this rewiring of your brain. I called it this, to allow the Holy Spirit to rewire your brain. Again, Paul, in conclusion, Paul says this in our text. The more pages I turn, the more stuff there's still there. I've got to quit. Look at this text that we read to you this morning. So how do we, how do we change this negative mindset? Paul says, if you pick this up in verse number 7 of Philippians 4, Paul said, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding. God, I don't understand what I'm going through, but I'm going to praise you through it. God, I don't understand why this happened, but I'm going to praise you through it. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding. I don't have a clue, God, what's going on and why, but this one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to keep my heart in check. I'm going to keep my mind in in check. I'm going to notice how I'm thinking. I'm going to pay attention to what I'm thinking about and really ask myself, do I need to be thinking about what I'm thinking about? Come on, somebody. I'm going to let the Holy Ghost come in. And then Paul says, shall keep your hearts and minds. He's going to keep your hearts. Not only is he going to keep your heart, God's going to keep my mind right when I give it to him. Verse number 8 and following, this is what Paul was saying. Finally, brethren, finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, whatsoever things are true, thy word is truth, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Hey, don't believe any more lies of the devil. The Bible says you'll believe a lie and be damned. Don't believe another lie of the devil. Quit falling into the devil's trap. Then he says in the Word, he says, whatsoever things are honest. Boy, that's something that's went out the, out the land today, hasn't it? Honest. Then he says, whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Oh, that's a big one. Pure heart. A pure mind. Keep your hearts pure. Anytime you see that thing called a laptop going in the wrong direction shut it 
Anytime you see that telephone, and, and now telephones are just as wicked and more so than laptops. We used to just think it's laptops. Any, anytime you see something in your life that, that ought not be going on, bring every thought into captivity. Don't let your mind go there. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, then he says, think on these things. So you notice what's going on in your brain, and then it ha there has to be a shift. And then the third thing is you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to rewire you. How many of you have been born again? When you've been born again, think about the old carnal man, the ugly old man that you were or the woman you were before you were saved. When the Holy Ghost comes in, when Jesus comes to live in your heart, like I said, heard it said, it's not turning over a new leaf. It's actually a brand new life. But oftentimes we try to get taken back into that old life, don't we? That's when we need to throw up the stop sign at the devil and say, like it's been said in the past, you can't touch this. I want you to stand with me. If I had to say I shared with you what I felt like God put in my heart today, I'd have to say, I shared it just the way that it came to me and how that I needed to share it today. And you say, well, that was good, but it wasn't for me. But you know what? It was for somebody. Amen? I remember a friend of mine, his name's Mike Nations. Mike Nations was a student down at a college, Gardner-Webb or somewhere down in uh, the mountains area, mountain area. He said one day as his professor came by his computer desk and he tapped on the computer screen. He said, look here, you got to understand. If you put trash in, you're going to get trash out. Mike Nation said that in a preaching service one time. He was my pastor at Clyde, still a great friend of mine. And that's just like you and I today. If we put nothing but trash in our brain, guess what's going to come out? We're in trouble. But if you do what this says, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, let the Holy Ghost do something in your life. Things are honest. Things are just. Things are pure. Things are lovely. Things of a good report. If there be any strength, if there be virtue, strength, if there be any praise, Paul said, think on these things. It's not changing negative into positive. But it's the thing that you're learning and making a biblical application to it. Needing, learning to think like Jesus thinks. Learning to speak and think like the Bible. Watch your life change if you do that. Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you today and we praise you and we thank you. We thank you, God, for thy word. For thy word is forever settled in heaven. Thy word is truth. And Father, without you, God, we cannot do anything at all. Father, I pray, God, even now that as we come to the conclusion of this service, God, my prayer is that something was said or done in the service today that would help somebody. Take somebody's life and turn it around for you and for your glory. Father, I know the enemy is going to do everything he can to attack our mind, attack our hearts, and attack our lives. Father, I pray for that one that walked into this room today struggling, that this message was for I pray, God, that you give them the deliverance that they need today. And God, that we would see you transform our minds and transform our lives. That we would become the very people, God, that you would have us to be. And Father, we love you and honor and praise you and thank you for that that you're doing and that that you're going to do. Maybe you're here today and this message was for you. I pray that it was. Maybe you're here today and you've never let Jesus into your heart. You've never asked Jesus into your heart to be saved, to be born again. My friend, that's where it starts. It starts with a born again experience. It starts with knowing who Jesus is and Lord and Savior. And maybe that's you today. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. I have sinned. I have wronged you, God. I've, I've transgressed against you. 
And I ask you, Jesus, right now to forgive me of all of my sins. Wash my sins away. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is my Lord and He is my Savior. I believe in His birth, His burial, His resurrection, and His soon coming. So Jesus, come in right now to my heart and forgive me of all of my sins. Start me on a brand new path. Start me on a brand new way following you. And we ask it in your precious name. If you prayed that prayer, let me know that. But for the rest of us that's here this morning, I believe that God wants us to work on our thinking. God bless you. Listen, this evening at 6 o'clock, bring all the goodies that we've talked about, and we'll see you in the gymnasium at 6 o'clock this evening. Have a great afternoon, and I love you.